God is love and in his love, Paul, again, we'll see he wrote there in the first of our key verses for today that we genuine believers were buried with Christ through baptism into death. And as he was raised from the dead, even so we also, Paul says there, should walk in newness of life. Walk in newness, Paul said, is what we should do. See, God is love, and in his love there is newness. Through the death and the resurrection of his only begotten son. Do you understand that today? Do you realize the great debt that we owe to the Lord today to have our sins forgiven and to now be able to walk in newness? Do you understand the debt that you owe the Lord today? My hope is that we would understand this. My hope is that we will understand the great debt that we owe in the Lord and that the father gave us his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Now, if you are unaware that you owe a debt, I want you to understand what I mean by the fact that we owe the Lord a great debt today. And in order for us to do this, I feel that we must take a look first at the resurrection of the only begotten son, Jesus Christ. When we take a look at the resurrection, I want you to again, understand what it confirms for us today. Firstly, the resurrection confirms that that Jesus truly was and is the only begotten son of God. Now remember how Satan, how he sarcastically spoke about how the father would not allow the son to be harmed Mm -hmm. when he went about trying to tempt Jesus Christ. With that in mind, we know that Jesus, he was crucified, but even though he was crucified, Jesus, he did not remain in the grave, did he? Jesus, he came out of the tomb. So I would say to you that even though Satan has sarcastically has said it, the father did not allow his son to truly be cast down today. That is what is confirmed to us in the resurrection. We'll see secondly on that same note that the resurrection of Christ, it confirms that the Lord is faithful to what he promised. He is faithful to what he promised in the garden to man and to himself and even to the devil as well in that his son rose from the grave in that in the death of Christ, he was able to go to hell and that he was able to proclaim victory over death. He was able to proclaim victory over sin. He was able to proclaim victory over the world. He was able to proclaim victory over the devil himself. And Jesus, when he rose from the grave, he said, all power, all authority has been given to him and to nobody else. Thirdly, the resurrection of Christ, as you have heard me say a lot in recent weeks, it confirms that the Lord loves us. The resurrection of Christ, it confirms that God is love Mm -hmm. and that in his love, he loves you. So, Because of his love, the Lord, he reconciled all of us unto himself. And he did this through the giving of his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. Now, let us remember this about the reconciliation, the work that was done through Christ. Reconciliation, we should remember, is the restoration of harmony between us and the Lord. Mm -hmm. It is the restoration of that fellowship that man once enjoyed with the Lord when he was in the garden. 
Now, prior to that reconciliatory work that was done through Christ, we were separated from the Lord because of our iniquities, because of our sin. There was a barrier that was raised between us and the Lord to where we were unable to be in and dwell in fellowship with him. But again, God, he loved us and he gave us his only begotten son to tear down that wall, to take out that gulf of separation and to bring us together. Yet because of Christ, the one of genuine faith, we are inseparable, Mm -hmm. even though we were once separated from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Through our fellowship, the Holy Spirit is transforming our hearts, and he's doing this around the clock so that we aren't what we used to be, so that we can again walk in newness. As Paul said to the Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Paul said, all things have passed away. Behold, Paul said, all things have become new. I believe that you are brand new today. If you get what I mean. Through Christ, all of us, we have been washed by his blood. As Jesus once said to Nicodemus, Mm -hmm. we are born again. We are born again with the promise that because of our faith, we will not perish. Mm -hmm. Because of our faith in the only begotten son of God, we will have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. So again, I tell you today that there is a debt that you owe. I tell you today that because of this work of Christ, because the father gave us his only begotten son, because the Lord loves you, there is a great debt that we owe today. I hope you understand what I mean. So let me ask all of you this today. How does it make you feel to know that God has loved you with so great a depth of love to save you? How does it make you feel to know that the Lord saved you from sin? How does it make you feel to know that God has never forsaken you? How does it make you feel to know that the Lord, he bears with you in all things, including all of our mess? We are filthy rags. Is what it said in the book of Isaiah by God himself. But God still loves you. How does it make you feel? To know that the Lord still loves you in all of your mess. Personally, the fact that the Lord loves me and all of my faults, and I tell you that my faults are many. I ain't ashamed of it. I tell you right now, I ain't perfect. I'm far from it. I can admit my faults. But I tell you today, the fact that God still loves me in all of my mess, it makes me feel wonderful. I I tell you today that the joy that I have today because God still loves me, it is indescribable. I can't explain to you the joy that I have to know that God still loves me when I'm imperfect. Sadly, I feel that too many of us, we take for granted the love that God has for us. I believe that we take for granted the promise that we have of being able to inherit the heavenly kingdom of the father. The work of reconciliation and the promise of the Lord should not be taken for granted because the promise and the work of reconciliation, what it has done for us is that it has given us a hope Hope that we cannot find in this world. Hope that we will never be able to obtain in this world. There is treasure 
mm-hmm. for us, but we will never find it in this world. Well. It is treasure that has been promised to us through the only begotten son mm-hmm. of God. And again, I tell you today, there is a depth that we, that you owe the Lord. In his letters, Paul, he was very sincere when he spoke about the love that had been shown to him, the love that he had received from the Lord. For example, in his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul, he wrote, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died and he died for all that those who live should live no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So Paul, he felt compelled to live for Christ because of the love that God had shown him. And I tell you today that he felt that all of us, we should be doing the same thing. We should be compelled in our hearts today to live for Christ. Because again, the Lord loves us. You see, as we know, Paul was a man that ruthlessly persecuted Christ and persecuted the church. Paul realized that had God not loved him, that he was on a path that would end in his eternal destruction. So Paul, I would tell you today that Paul, he was a man that was very grateful for what God had done for him. Paul was grateful for his end destination to no longer be eternal destruction, but for his end destination to be an end destination of happiness, of peace, and of joy today. And again, I tell you today that that too can be your end destination. Should you love the one that loved you first? In his letter to the believers in Rome, we'll see here, or we'll see in my other key verse there in the eighth chapter, in the 12th verse, we'll see where Paul wrote that we are debtors, is what Paul said there. Paul said that we are debtors not to the flesh. You're not a debtor to live according to the flesh. Is what Paul said there. This again expresses Paul's gratefulness for the love that he had received from God. And I would tell you today that it calls for us to come to realize the same exact thing in that we are debtors. Again, I ask you today, do you realize that you are a debtor to the Lord? Do you realize that you owe a great debt to God today? You see, a debtor is one who owes another. And I'm telling you today that you owe God. The notion from Paul is that we are not in debt to our flesh. The notion here is that we do not owe our lives to satisfy the lust of our flesh. In other words, you don't owe your flesh anything. I don't believe enough of us understand and realize that today. You see, Paul was stating that we owe our lives to the one that actually saved us. Paul was saying that we owe our lives to the Lord. Without God, we would have nothing. Is what Paul was saying there. That's what we should understand today. Without God, you would have nothing. You would be lost without the Lord today. Do you know that? Oh, yeah. Amen. And some of us would wonder, why do we owe our lives to God? That's how some of us live. As we saw Paul say to the Romans in my sermon last week, we did not receive the spirit of bondage to fear from the Lord. 
No, through Christ, we receive the spirit of adoption by the father to be heirs of his and joint heirs with Christ. The heavenly kingdom, I tell you today, the heavenly kingdom, it is ours. The heavenly kingdom is yours to claim today. You have a right to heaven. God has given you that right by his only begotten son. Yes, so why do so many of us live our lives and work so hard like we owe it to our flesh? To satisfy his lust, to, to fulfill his lust. I must ask today, what has your flesh done for you? I mean, just, just think about that for a moment. Think about it honestly for a moment today. When you think about it, it is absolutely crazy how some, how some of us have, have gone about living our lives today. You see, many of us, we begin to put our lust before the Lord. Do you understand what I mean by that? Many of us, by the way that we live, we are putting the lust of our flesh and, and fulfilling those lusts before the Lord. And as you have heard me say before, we are saying that God don't come first in our lives. The one who saved you from sin, from eternal destruction, you're turning around and you're saying, I'm not going to put you ahead of anything in my life. I want to satisfy my wants before you, even though you gave your own son for me. It is crazy how many of us put our flesh and his lust before the Lord today. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with living to enjoy life and to be happy. But may I suggest to you today that you can do that by putting God first in your life. I am a living testimony of what happens when we put God first in our lives. I should not be standing here before you today, but here I am standing before you today, proclaiming God today because I owe the Lord a debt today and I live my life doing my best to pay back the debt that I owe. Now this I know will sound crazy to many, but think about it again. What has being obedient to the lust of your flesh? What has it done for you? Where has this obedience, where has it gotten you today? Many of us, we live with broken hearts today. Many of us, we are living with our soul deep in despair and in depression because we are living for the lust of our flesh instead of turning to the one who can fix, who can mend our wounded and our broken spirits today. Did satisfying your lust wash you clean of your sins? Did it guarantee you to be able to walk in the newness of life? Did it, fulfilling the lust of your flesh, give you an heirship to be able to inherit the kingdom of the Lord, our God? Did satisfying your lust make it so that you can live in eternal happiness, peace, and joy? I don't know about all of you, but to me, when I look out there in the world today and I see so many living by the lust of their flesh, I don't see anybody finding any kind of happiness. Not eternal happiness not eternal peace, not eternal joy as well. And again, I get that this may sound like foolishness to some, but as you have heard me say before, the happiness that you may get from fulfilling the lust of your flesh, it is temporary. It will pass away over time. And in the end, the only thing fulfilling the lust of the flesh has ever truly done for you is create a bunch of mess, mm -hmm. create a bunch of conflict mm -hmm. that does nothing but tear you up on the inside. And also it tears you away from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a man who understood his sin and how he tore others apart and was separating himself from the Lord, Paul, he was grateful to again be saved from destruction. 
Paul, he was so grateful to be saved that he chose to throw away his selfish ambitions and to live his life paying back the debt that he owed God. And so again, I ask you today, what will you do? What about you? Has God not done so much for you? Has God not done so much that you would even take into consideration that there is a debt that you owe the Lord? I believe that God has done a lot for all of us. I may not know what he has done specifically for you, but I can see you today. I know that you are blessed today. So that I know that God has done something from you for you. I know that God lifts us up over all of our afflictions. I know that the enemy has no victory over us. I know that all of us have overcome today. I know that it has been done by God. So again, I know that there is a debt that all of us owe to the Lord today. So let's look at paying back the debt that we owe to the Lord today. As Paul said, I now say to you, we again, we are all debtors, not to the flesh, not to live according to the flesh and his lust. We are debtors to the Lord today. We are debtors to the one who loved us with so great a depth of love that he again saved us from the guilt the penalty of sin. Now, in order for us to pay back the debt that we owe, Paul, he said that we should walk in the newness of life there in the first of my key verses. Specifically, we will see that Paul stated there in the 12th verse in the sixth chapter of Romans He stated that we should not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. We should not obey its lust is what we'll see Paul say there. So in order for us to walk in newness, Paul, we will see he encouraged us further there in the 13th verse. He encouraged us to present ourselves to God as being alive from the dead. You as a child of God, all of you who have genuinely believed you are not dead in your souls today. You are alive because of God. We'll see Paul. He said further there in that same verse, We are to commit our members, that is, our bodies. We are to commit them to be instruments of righteousness to the Lord, our God. As you have heard me say a lot this year, it is time for us to truly cast off our old selves. It is time for us to throw old man and his wicked ways. It's time for us to throw them in the trash and to set those old ways on fire. I don't know if you hear me here today. You see, this manner of living, it is actually presented to us in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, in our key verse, Paul said that we died and that we were buried with Christ. Now, somebody will say today, I'm not dead. I'm I'm right here, preacher. But Paul, he again said that in our key verse that we died and that we were buried with Christ. Think about this. And I want you to think about this spiritually speaking, not worldly so that you can understand the point that I'm about to make here to you on the cross. We know that Christ, that he became our propitiation. We know that on the cross that Christ became sin and that he died bearing our sins as the scapegoat. So if we were buried with Christ, And we were risen with him as well. Spiritually speaking, understand. Then guess what should be left in the grave? Guess what? If you are a genuine believer, you are buried with Christ. And then you are resurrected with Christ. Somebody say, preach. I haven't died and been resurrected. 
But again, spiritually speaking, if you were buried with Christ and you rose with Christ, guess what should be remaining behind in the grave? That old man. Wickedness. Sin. Unrighteousness. You see, when, when Christ was resurrected, he was no longer what he had become when he was on the cross. He had become sin while he hung there on the cross. But when Jesus exited that tomb, when he rose from the grave, Jesus, he was holy. Jesus, he was righteous. Jesus, he was glorified. He was perfect. I don't know if you get what I'm saying here today. Paul, he wrote that Christ is the firstborn from the dead. You see, he is the image of the glory that we can and that we will be if we faithfully follow him. Therefore, since we are risen with him through our faith, our sins, again, they should remain behind us. They should remain in the grave today. They should remain there so that we can walk in newness. You are a new creation is what Paul said. So the first step that we should take when it comes back to paying back that great debt that we owe to the Lord, that first step is to put off that old man and his wicked ways. If you want to pay back that debt that you owe the Lord, you will turn away from sin. You'll turn away from unrighteousness and you will walk in newness. So therefore, I would then say to you that the second step to paying back the debt that we owe the Lord is to actually walk in that newness. It is to walk in faith. It is to be faithful to the Lord. I don't know if you hear me here today. You see, I want you to understand today that it will be completely devastating for us to say that we are being faithful to the Lord, to say that we believe in him, but then the whole time we have turned back to unrighteousness and are walking in wickedness. Now, to understand this devastation, the writer of the book of Hebrews wrote that it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift and the word of God to be renewed after they openly shame the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, to some of us, that verse, it may not sound like it make much sense, but let me make it make some sense for you. To fall back into the ways of wickedness would be to invalidate the cross. It would be to invalidate Christ, him dying on the cross, and then it would invalidate his resurrection as well. Did you hear what I said there? To fall back into the ways of sin would be to invalidate Jesus Christ. It will make what he had done by drinking that cup of bitterness. It will make it vain. It will make it meaningless. In other words, I want you to understand that when one falls out of faith, they are making the death and the resurrection of Christ. They are making it pointless. It is truly devastating to make vain the cross as it crosses the unpardonable line and it blasphemes the Lord. The one that falls back, the one that isn't being faithful, the one that makes the cross vain, they commit themselves to live according to their lust, to fulfilling the lust of their flesh rather than living according to the spirit. Paul said that this one's living is evident through such acts of uncleanness, selfishness, contentions, and hatred. So rather than paying back the debt that they owe, 
this one becomes an apostate. They fall out of faith and they make a mockery of the love that God has shown them. Imagine living your life in a manner where you once believe, but then you turn your back. You turn your back on the love that God has shown you. As one who truly recognizes the great debt we owe, I tell you today that we should never move to invalidate Jesus Christ. We should never move to invalidate the love that God has shown to us. I repeat to you again today. We are debtors, not to the flesh. We are debtors to the Lord. Therefore, if you recognize this and you desire to pay back that great debt that you owe, the second step for us today is be faithful. Live your life in faith to God. Walk in newness. Walk with a new purpose of living. Don't walk in those old ways. Now, in order for us to pay back the great debt we owe, Paul, he again, he wrote to the believers in Rome in the 13th chapter of Romans and the eighth verse. Paul, he wrote, owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another, Paul said, has fulfilled the law. This is a desire, I believe, that should dwell in all of our hearts, all of us who are genuine and sincere in our faith in the Lord. I, I, I tell you today that we should not be compelled to hate each other. If you are sincere in your faith, you genuinely believe in the Lord, you should be compelled to love because God is love. As John said in his first epistle, we should be compelled to love because the Lord, he loved us first. Even again, when we were a sinful mess, the Lord loved us before we loved him. To the believers in Rome, Paul, he shared with them there in the 13th chapter of Romans and starting there in the ninth verse. We'll see where he shared with them the commandments of love. Paul said that if you desire to to pay back that great debt that you owe the Lord, he said, don't you go out there committing adultery. He said, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness. Paul, he said to us, don't go out there coveting what somebody else has if you want to pay back the great debt that you owe to the Lord. As again, you often hear me reference Jesus. He said that we should love the Lord with all of our hearts. And he said that we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. I know you don't heard me say that a billion times now. You see, one who chooses to ignore these commandments is one that is openly put into shame Jesus Christ. The ways that he taught us, they're put into shame his death and his resurrection. They're putting to vain, they're making it meaningless, his purpose. You see, I often preach about how we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves because, again, it fulfills the law. It fulfills what God desires from us. You see, God is love and in his love, he uplifts us. The Lord, he desires that we uplift those that are around us. Therefore, we pay back the great debt that we owe by doing just as he did. We pay back the debt that we owe by loving and by uplifting our neighbors. Do you hear me here today?
You see, in all of these things, we truly pay back the debt we owe when we live for the one who gave his life for us. We pay back the debt that we owe when we genuinely live for Christ himself. Well, Paul, we will see, stated that in the 13th chapter of Romans and the 11th verse, Paul, he stated and said that the time is now for us to awake out of sleep. Again, I tell you that, that you aren't sleeping today. You are not dead in your soul today because Christ, Christ has quickened us. He has awakened us out of our sleep. So Paul, he said that now is the time for us to wake out of our sleep because our salvation, Paul said, is nearer than we first believed. Do you understand? Do you realize? Do you know today that salvation is at hand? You see, this thought, it calls our attention to the whole purpose for Christ being manifested in our world in the first place. Christ, he died on the cross and he rose from the grave, not to condemn the world. The third chapter of John's gospel in the 17th verse tells us that Christ came to save, not to condemn anybody. Jesus, he said it himself that, again, he was not sent to this world to destroy anybody. He was sent to, to save souls. You see, some believe that salvation is off in the distant future. All right. All right. That it is just so far off from us that, that we can't even see it. Yeah. That we can't lay a grasp of it. But let me tell you this today. Salvation is closer than you think. All right. All right. You see, Christ, he made it clear that he can return at any moment in time. That ain't me saying it. That's what Christ said. Let us remember that Jesus said that no one knows the day and hour of his coming. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, Jesus said, knows when he is going to come. The only one that knows when he is coming is the father. And it can happen at any second, which means to us today that salvation is at hand. It is right around the corner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what this means for you today is that you should be taking heed mm -hmm. to what the Lord has said. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you should be on watch. Mm -hmm. You should be praying. You should be living diligently, expecting for the Lord to come back at any second now. Mm -hmm. That's how you should be living your lives today. Because at any second, the Lord could be coming and knocking on your door and saying, hey, it's time for me to collect. Mm -hmm. And again, I tell you, there is a debt that you owe. And you better believe that the Lord is going to come knocking on that door saying, hey, it's time for me to collect. Mm -hmm. So again, as Paul said, if we desire to pay back the great debt we owe to the Lord, we should do as Paul said. Mm -hmm. Paul said that we should cast off the works of darkness there in the 12th verse of the 13th chapter of Romans. Mm -hmm. And he said that we should put on the armor of light. Mm -hmm. You should be walking in a newness today. Jesus has not left you to sin. He didn't leave your soul in the grave. Should you believe in him? Mm -hmm. He told your soul just as he told Lazarus, get up. Walk out of that too. It's time for us to do just as Jesus did. Resurrection Sunday, Easter, is considered by many to be the least popular holiday there is. Probably because outside of a rabbit, some eggs, and some chocolate, uh, there ain't really a way to commercialize it anymore. You know, ain't too many people going out today looking for suits. <laughs> ain't, ain't too many out there looking for dresses for Easter in, anymore. 
But I tell you that those that are sincere in the faith and those those that walk in the newness of Christ, I tell you that we are rejoicing today. We, we celebrate, yes, the resurrection of Christ today, but I want you to understand that there's something else that we celebrate as well today. We celebrate our resurrection. Your soul is alive today in a world where there are many dead souls that are wandering around. You have been resurrected in the spirit by Jesus Christ today. And you, you should be walking in newness today. Through Christ, our spirits are again made alive. They are no longer dead. And again, I ask, do you understand that you owe a great debt to the Lord because of that? So, yes, I tell you today that we are debtors, not to the flesh, but to Christ. Therefore, because we are debtors to Christ, guess who we should be living for today? You should be living for Christ today. We must not make his death. We must not make his resurrection. We must not make it vain. We must not make it meaningless today. And so Paul there in the 13th chapter of Romans and the 13th verse he encouraged us to walk properly once again. He said that we should not walk in reverie and drunkenness, nor in lewdness and lust. Look at that. He said that we should not walk in strife and envy as well. You see, this is how we faithfully live for Christ. This is how we not fall into apostasy. This is how we pay back the debt that we owe. You see, I want to close out this series, this five sermon series that I've preached. I want to close it out on this note. God, he is love. And again, in his love, he did not create us for eternal destruction. Do you understand today that God did not create you to be destroyed? He saved you. He saved you from that condemnation. He saved you from that damnation. He saved you from destruction. Because God loves us, the debt we owe is to share with others that they can be saved. To share with others that salvation is near, that salvation is at hand, and that it is time to wake up and realize what God has done for them and to live their lives for Christ. Yes, God is drawing near to collect what is due. And I tell you today that you don't want to be caught slacking. Therefore, let us diligently strive to pay back the great debt of love that we owe to the Lord by fulfilling and by faithfully walking in the newness that has been given to us by His only begotten Son through His death and through his resurrection. Amen. Amen. Amen.